In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week we're going to continue to look at what Sir Paul has to say in our lesson from the Romans. And again, it will probably help to have the text in front of us. So if we want to pause this video, do it now so that you can get the text in front of you. It's Romans 6, verses 1 to 11. Our passage today starts in an odd place with a question, what then are we to say? It makes us think immediately, what are we going to say about what? A bit like a moment when you walk into in on a conversation and really want to know what was being said before you walked into the room. In this letter, what Paul had been talking about before this was the grace of God making many righteous and bringing eternal life. We might be a bit apprehensive about using that term righteousness. At its simplest, though, through Jesus, God set us right, brought us into his kingdom with the promise of life everlasting. Through this act, God opened his heart of love for us, to all of us, to everyone. And I think one of the reasons we're not terribly comfortable with righteousness is that it can be confused with self-righteousness, which generally doesn't win friends or influence people and is pretty unattractive when we encounter it, and certainly won't set us right with God. Both Matthew's Gospel and our passage from Romans centre on righteousness being a gift through our faith in God's love, love shown in those saving acts of Jesus, which Paul goes on to talk about in this passage. Let's unpack this a bit more with the next thing that Paul says. The supplementary question then, after what then are we to say, is should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? It kind of sounds like if we sin and God forgives us with his grace abounding, we make God look good, aka us sinning is good for, God, for God's re reputation. Paul rapidly says this is not what I mean, and then in rather difficult language goes on to explain what he does mean. We suffer a bit here because we aren't first century Roman Christians, the original recipients of this letter. Paul answers himself, as he often does, by no means. Of course we should not continue to sin, he says, because we have been baptised into Christ. Paul continues to stress this close identification of each and every believer with Jesus Christ, as we believers are on a journey to becoming more like Jesus day by day. He uses aspects of Jesus' story to identify our journey, using phrases such as buried with him through baptism into his death in verse 4, united with him in death and resurrection in verse 5, crucified with him in verse 6, and finally live with him in verse 8. Following on from this deep sense of identification with the life and saving acts of Jesus and the freedom from slavery to sin this brings, Paul asks us to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Difficult as this is, let's also unpack these a bit more. What does it mean? Let's start with I'm dead to sin. What does that mean? It means I recognise the power of the saving love of Jesus in my life. It means I have chosen to love God and live the way that God says is best for me. It means I recognise the merciful, forgiving nature of God and its power in my life. I know, therefore, that I am living in God's kingdom now, living in his love and with his promise of love for eternity to rely on. However, I am dead to sin does not mean I am incapable of sinning. At times when I make wrong choices and I don't do what I should or I do what I shouldn't, when this happens, if I am dead to sin, I need to seek forgiveness, the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of those I may have hurt along the way. The principle at its simplest is that I know that repentance and seeking forgiveness and being forgiving is the path to a life that is worth living and worthy of God's love for me. But just to say there are in life some very difficult circumstances when it is not as simple as that too. 
let's move on from that to I am alive to God in Christ Jesus. What a powerful phrase that is. I'll say it again. I am alive to God in Christ Jesus. This sentence reminded me of some teaching I heard from Timothy Radcliffe some 11 years ago. It was about being fully alive in God. Now, Timothy is a Roman Catholic priest and a Dominican friar. He's written many books, but he's particularly impressive if you have the opportunity to hear him in person. For him, being fully alive is being alive to God. And he had three aspects to this being alive. Being nurtured in the Christian faith in a way that helps us know and cherish ourselves and the gifts God has given us. Working out our faith and how we live with one another, cherishing others we have to journey with. And then how we draw others to faith and share the love that God has given us. In short, knowing ourselves as beloved children of God, having others to travel with to help us and being a channel of God's love to those around us all pretty good principles to live by. But he didn't stop there. He felt that three things were essential to being alive to God in Christ Jesus. And what he thought these were may surprise us. Firstly, that our faith is active. It's something we are actively engaged in, impacting our day-to-day -day lives. Yes, it engages our intellects, but not just our intellects. It's about matters of the heart and how we approach our lives. It's not passive or primarily about letting others do it for us. Secondly, faith is not just an individual thing. It really needs a community element. I am longing for the day when we can worship together and I can get to know you better face to face. And I have really, really missed this community element of our walk, especially in these early days of my time here. We need the encouragement and strengthening of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I am hugely grateful and thankful for all the phone support and socially distant practical support that has been going on. But being a Christian is something where fellowship is essential. It will be good when we get to the point where we can pray privately in our beautiful buildings. But even better when the day comes when we can pray together that's going to present challenges, and for some in the most vulnerable groups, this will not be possible for some time, which God will understand. It will not surprise you, as your rector, that I think being a Christian and not belonging to a church doesn't make sense. I think taking this approach means we are missing out big time. Faith is not designed to be practised in isolation from our fellowship. The church is also not the building, but the people in it. We are the body of Christ here, our love of God and our love of each other. And each person is special and valued and essential. The third essential element for Timothy Radcliffe is probably the most surprising, living lightheartedly and joyfully. Being free not to take ourselves too seriously, to gain confidence through believing together as God intended it. Grow in love having loving eyes for the beauty of people around us and not judgmental ones, tuning in to God's playful creativity, to move away from the mechanical cause and effect and understanding of a world rooted, have an understanding of the world rooted in a more organic and natural understanding. Let ourselves be touched by people's experiences and have hearts of flesh, not hearts of stone. The opposite of joyfulness, Timothy Radcliffe said, is hardness of heart. I recognise in myself at this time the need to step back and take a deep breath and look for the good and the joy. I can't lie, I've been finding the current situation pretty stressful. I'm not particularly a fan of moving targets and layers of changing guidance. And in my honest, three versions of an important and essential risk assessment in less than a week pushes my buttons. But there is a way through this, and the love of God is steadfast and inspiring. Our gospel passage today clearly pointed that the going is not always going to be straightforward. Challenges and conflicts will come along the way. The important thing is to stay in this moment now, to stay connected to the influence of the Holy Spirit, and to look for the joy. 
An old holy habit of mine is to look at the end of each day for something to be thankful for. And I'm going to finish by asking you to think in the week ahead about how we can live our lives more joyfully, even in these, our pandemic times. And as we think about living more joyfully in our times, let's echo those sentiments of St Paul's letter to the Romans. We are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen.